Okay, so last time we finished with the derived functors. <coughs> we consider the following situation. Take two abelian categories, A and B. Then we, thought, we saw that on the level of the homotopy categories, so uh, yeah, and let's uh, cho choose a functor, F, functor from A to B. For homotopy categories, there is no problem to define this extension H of F on the acting from the homotopy category of A to the homotopy category of B. But of course, there was a problem to define a functor which we want to call something like a derived functor. So maybe I don't, don't want to write D of F. So the standard notation for this would be something like R of F. This is the derived notation for the derived functor. And this is supposed to be a functor from G of A to the D of B. So this is the question. Can we define this? And the idea that we used last time was the following. It's not clear immediately how to define this functor, but at least we know in the special situation where suppose A has enough, has enough injectives, then in this case, we know that D plus of A is equivalent as triangulated category to the H plus of A. And this allows us to define the derived functor. So the proper notation, so I think last time I just wrote RF, but the proper notation would be R plus for the F. This would be a derived functor for, from the D plus of A to the D plus of B. And how we define this functor? Well, we kind of look at the following diagram. We start with H plus of A. So then here we, get, we have a functor H of F to the H plus of B. By the way, it's, it's not ne necessary to, to assume that I have a functor between abelian categories. I can start with this functor. I can just say that suppose I have a triangulated functor between these homotopy categories and everything works. It's just a kind of classical setting where you start with the, with the functor between abelian categories, but it's not important for the construction. <coughs> so here we have two localization functors. Q, B, this is the localization functor to the D plus of B. And here we have the, the localization functor Q, A to the D plus of A. But what was important is that we have the, we have the subcategory H plus or for the, sorry, there is a mild mistake in my statement. This is definitely not A. This is the homotopy category of injectives in the A. So this needs to be corrected. Now, the homotopy category of the injectives of A, this is embedded into the homotopy category of A. But this embedding is, I mean, because we know that this embedding composed with the localization functor gives us an equivalence, so there's a functor going in the other direction. Phi. Right? And just by looking at this diagram, we can give a de definition for the derived functor R, R plus F. So R plus F. This is the composition, by definition, this is the composition of three functors. So first of all, well, I, s I, want to, I want the functor acting here, right? So this is where R plus of F is supposed to be. So I need to start with an object in the, in the D plus of A. So then I can apply to this object phi, right? So this is my first functor. What I'm doing essentially, I'm just taking an object and I place this object with the resolution. Now, because this category sits inside H plus of A, I can apply this homotopy functor, H of F. So the second functor is H of F. And then, now this give, give me some complex, but I don't want to consider this complex up to homotopy, but up to quasi-isomorphism. So I need to apply Q of A to this. And this is the definition. This kind of constructive definition. <coughs> so, that was last time. Now, today I want to formulate a proposition 
I don't want to d define in this course derived functors by universal property, but at least I want to formulate the universal property. So the proposition is the universal property of the derived functor R plus F. And the universal property has two parts. So the first part is that there is a natural transformation natural transformation between two functors. So the composition of the localization QB and the H of F to the R plus F composed with the QA. So I cannot say that this square of four categories and four factors is commutative in general, but at least I have a natural transformation in one direction. And the second property is that this natural transformation is kind of uh, universal, right? So for any other functor, <coughs> let's call this G, functor from the G plus of A to the G plus of B. So any natural transformation any natural transformation from the composition of the localization functor QB is H of F to the composition of G with the localization functor QA. So any such natural transformation factors through a unique natural transformation R plus F to the G. So we're going to prove this statement in the next assignment. So the proof is exercise. It's not that important. We're not going to use this. Well, at least, well, maybe we use this a couple of times, this universal property. But the constructed definition for us will be more important. OK. That's all I want to say about, yeah, and that's, not, that's not all I want to say. There is a kind of remark. So remark is the following, uh, an exact functor. Now I want to do this in, a, in general situation. So let's say that an in, in, in exact functor F between two homotopy categories So an exact functor is called derivable. If there is a functor RF satisfying the universal property, so this is how we can define them in general. And now have another little exercise. And in, in, well, this ex exercise is not easy. So the next exercise is just for a couple of minutes, probably. You just need to convince yourself that two statements, well, a criterion for a functor to be derivable is true. So f is derivable if and only if there is a triangulated subcategory. Let's call this maybe KF, depending on the functor F inside the homotopy category uh, 
Well, of course, in all these situations, there are versions. You can consider H plus, H minus, just H. Well, probably the just H is the most complicated case. Let me restrict our attention to the H plus. So this will be the most important application of algebraic geometry. But I'm going to say something about H minus in a minute. So F is derivable if there is this triangulated subcategory. This is the so-called category of adapted objects. So uh, subcategory KF. So which is called adapted to the functor F <coughs> such that we have two properties. So the first property is that if you take an object, say complex X in the category KF, so if this object is acyclic, then F applied to this object is again acyclic. So F is derivable if there's this category with the first property. And the second property, of course, uh, essentially the same as for, in, uh, for the injective resolutions. So if you take any object, now say in the H plus of A, then any object, da, 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 any object is quasi-isomorphic, so x is quasi-isomorphic to the object in the KF, say to y, which sits inside KF. So this is just kind of general definition and general property, but of course we already know examples. So examples of these adapted subcategories are the following. So first example, if A contains enough injectives <coughs> then H plus of the injectives in this category is adapted for any left exact functor. So essentially, there's a, another point of view, more general point of view of what we just defined. We can start with the universal property, then notice this little observation, and then kind of Use, use this adapted category to say that any left, uh, left exact functor is derivable. Of course, there's a dual construction where you consider categories with enough injectives, uh, sorry, enough projectives. So if A contains enough projectives, then you can take H minus of the projectives in the category A. So the same construction as before it would actually tell us that this is equivalent to the D minus of A. Or you can kind of dualize the construction and construct projective resolution for any object in the D minus. So if this contains enough projectives, then this H minus of PA is adapted for any right exact functor. And of course, in this case, well, 
we will get a functor from the d minus of a to the d minus of b. And the notation for this functor is L minus of f. OK. Now this is definitely all I want to say in general about derived functors. So what is the relation between exact functors of abelian categories and exact functors of commodity categories? Because it seems that if you have an exact functor on abelian categories, there is no problem with extending it. Right? Yes, there is no problem. And I mentioned this last time. Yes, for, for exact functors, uh, you immediately, because exact functors, well, one of the definitions would be that this ma they map acyclic objects to acyclic objects. So immediately, you'll get the commutative diagram of this. So if a functor between commodity categories is exact and is deduced from a functor between abelian categories, it is not necessarily true that this f is exact. No, th this functor is always exact. For any additive f? For any additive f, f yes. Okay, we're going to do a lot of examples of the right functors. Probably, well, not ne well. I think next time we'll start the right functors in algebraic geometry, and there will be at least a couple of lectures about the right functors in algebraic geometry. So we're going to see a lot of examples. But today I want to consider again some general example, not from algebraic geometry, just kind of from category theory. So this example is the x functor. So the x functor is derived from the home functor. And home functor you, you always have. You don't need to work with, with any specific category to define this functor. <coughs> OK. So we can start with the following, for example. Uh, take abelian category with enough injectives. And fix an object. So A is an object in the category A. So I'm, I'm trying to write this differently for the object and for the category. <coughs> so then we have the following functor, home, where I fix the first argument. First argument is just object A. So of course, I take the home in the category A. Well, the second argument well, is, some, is something from the category A. And the result will be in the abelian groups. So this is the category of abelian groups. Now I can take this functor and derive it. Right, so there is the derived functor, say, R plus home as a functor with a fixed object A. So as a functor, this is a functor from the derived category D plus of A to the D plus of the abelian groups. And finally, you can define X. Again, the terminology is that this is sometimes called the total derived functor. And if you take the homology of this object, well, you plug in, uh, plug in some arguments, say you want to find x between a and b, right? So x with the index i, <coughs> you're supposed to compute the total derived functor. This is some complex of abelian groups. So for this complex, we can take some homology h i. So this is the definition of the, of the x i between a and b. And I think this, uh, if you think about this, this is exactly the definition you use in the basic homological algebra course, right? Because what you do, you, well, for example, fix A, you take B, you replace B with injective resolution, and then compute the corresponding homology. So this is kind of standard definition. There is nothing surprising here. 
what I think is a little bit more surprising is the following proposition. <coughs> so I'm continuing to assume that my category A has enough objectives. So suppose I have two objects in this abelian category. <coughs> so then I have the following natural isomorphism between group between the group XI and objects A and B. So this is in the category A and between the homes in the derived category of A between object A and object B shifted by I. Right? The same A the same I that we have here. So you can actually compute X as the homes in the derived category by using shift. And by the way, this is sometimes used for notation before I prove this in any triangulated category, say T, if you take two objects, say A and B in T, and if you want to define the X I between two objects in the any abstract triangulated category, well, you can just by its definition say that this is the home between shifted objects. So kind of abstract definition of the X. Okay, now let's prove this. So the proof essentially consists of a couple of isomorphisms. So first isomorphism is the following. Or well, maybe I, I want to start with the, with the definition, classical definition of the XI. So maybe a fix, fix a resolution for the object B, injective resolution. And first, I claim that the following isomorphism is, is true. I take this xi between A and B. Then this is isomorphic uh, to the home in the homotopy category between objects A and a set of B. I use resolution i, and I shift this resolution by the index i. So this is the first step in the proof. And in fact, this is quite straightforward to see, right? We essentially, we can just compare the definitions of the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And you can see the definitions are the same, right? Because what's, well, we all know definition of this side. What, what we will have here? Well, you're supposed to take this complex, say, start with I0, go to I1, da, da, da somewhere you will get i with the index i. And so this is the second argument. The first argument is object A. So I can think about this object A just as a complex that sits, well, has only one non-trivial object A in the degree 0, and all other kind of elements in this complex are trivial objects, zero objects. Now, how I can compute this home in the homotopy category? Well, I'm supposed to have maps like this, right? And all the squares has to be commutative. But maybe I need to write i with the index i plus 1 and also i with the index i minus 1. Okay. So, but commutativity of this square, right? So, of course, I can imagine that I have all the maps here, but this is all zero maps. So, essentially, the commutativity of the map means that this composition is zero, right? But then I have to, if I want to understand this home and the homotopy category, I need to take a quotient by the maps that are of the form large D of H, right? By the definition. We define the home in the homotopy category as the kernel of this T module, the image of this large T. But this means that this H 
Well, this h has to, has to be of degree minus 1. So the degree of h is minus 1. So that's a map like this. So of course, I can try to draw another map like this, but it will be just a zero map. It won't give me any contribution to the differential. So essentially, I need to take the maps from a to ii, such that this composition is zero. And then I need to take the quotients by the maps from a to ii, such that I have a I can factor these maps through the previous object in the resolution, i with the index i minus 1. So this is what I'm supposed to do if I just apply the definition. The homotopy category? Well, the definition I gave you was the following. Well, you, we considered the, maybe let me use x and y. So we consider this internal home, so the graded home. On this internal home, as, as a graded object, it's, it's easy to write. This will be just a sum, say, over some k. Uh, this will be a home between x and y shifted by k, right? So all the maps for, for all possible degrees. And also on this object, we have the differential d. And the differential d was defined as the, the super commutator of the differential on the f. So this will be plus or minus. Uh, FT. So of course, I can write the explicit sign. So this is something like minus, then I have minus 1 raised to the power of the degree of f. So that was our kind of graded, uh, graded home. And then for this graded home, you can take, if you want to, you want to home in the ho uh, homotopy category between two complexes, you need to take this graded home and then take the zeros to homology. That's the definition I gave maybe a lecture two ago. But of course, what, what it means, well, it means that you, we, we have this differential d. So in the h0, we need to take the kernel of d in degree 0. That's exactly maps of degree 0 commuting with the differential. So this, that's how we define, for example, uh, mm, home in the category of complexes. Right? And then we need to take a quotient by the image of this d. But image of, of this d will be exactly elements of this form, d of h, where h has degree minus 1. So that's, a, that's the definition I'm using here to understand the, the right-hand right -hand side of this isomorphism. But now, that's exactly the definition of this text. Right? Because how you, how, you, how you do this, well, you need to take the cohomology, uh, so between home a and the injective resolution. If you look at the definition of this cohomology of this home complex, that's exactly the same definition. So these two things has to be isomorphic. Okay, so the next step is to notice the following isomorphism. So if I take home in the homotopy category between A. So now what's important that the second argument is the complex of injectives. So this is the only thing that will be important for the rest of the argument. So I claim that this is isomorphic to the home in the derived category of A between the same objects. OK. So how are you supposed to compute homes in the derived category? Well, starting from the definition, you need to, uh, to do something like this. You take A, then you replace this using some quasi-isomorphism with some object t. And then from t, you consider maps to the resolution i and shift it by the index i. <coughs> right? 
but I claim that this, the fact that we replace this by a quasi isomorphism doesn't play any role because we have the following that home in the homotopy category between A and um, I can keep the shift, but the shift, of course, not important here. So in the homotopy category, if I replace the first, well, if the second argument is the complex of injectives and the first argument are two objects which are quasi-isomorphic, which is the case in these situations, then the home is the same. And again, okay, so if we believe in this fact, then we essentially done, right? Because we reduce to this home. So if I call this home star, And I can continue star. Now I have a home in the derived category. So if I replace the second argument by the isomorphic object in the derived category, I will definitely have the same home. So this is home D of A, A, and now this will be B shifted by I and be done. So the only part which is left is this statement. And again, I claim that essentially you know the statement from the basic homological algebra. So maybe to be completely precise, I can formulate this as exercise in two versions. So the first version is what we need. Um, I might be, maybe let, let, let me do even more general. So this, this home in the homotopy category is just the zeros to homology. So it's here of the internal home. So maybe let me formulate exercise for the internal home. So if I have a map from A to B, which is quasi-isomorphism, and I is a complex of injectives, then I claim that uh, this quasi-isomorphism can be extended to the quasi-isomorphisms of the internal homes or graded homes. So the home, so the graded home between A and I, maybe I need to put dots everywhere for complexes. This is quasi-isomorphic to the home B and I. So this is quasi-isomorphism. So I'll say this is the first part of the exercise, but I think that it's a little bit more convenient to prove the second part, and the second part immediately implies the first part. It says the following. So if A is a cyclic complex, and I, as before, is the complex of injectives, then the home is acyclic. So it's not hard to see that two immediately implies one, but to prove two, you need some kind of standard arguments from the homological algebra. There's nothing surprising here. So I'm going to use this exercise in the, in the proof, and I'm also going to use this a little bit later today. Okay, so this was the situation. So the problem is that in this definition, we start with the object, right, in the category A. In general, you want to know how to compute the X between two complexes. Let's try to repeat the same construction, 
but instead of taking A in the category, abelian category A, I take any complex. So A now is the complex with objects in the abelian category A. I can define X again. <clears throat> so now I have the derived functor of the R home with the dot, so the internal R home. I fix, I fix the first argument, the complex A, <clears throat> and derive with respect to the second argument. So this will be a functor from the D plus of the category A to the D plus of the category of abelian groups. And now I can define the X groups between two complexes, A and B. So this is the abraded definition. Instead of using objects, I now have complexes. Just by definition saying that this is the cohomology with the index i of the, well, again, I need to write R plus of the R plus home, internal home, graded home of complexes A and B. So I claim that you think about this, you can prove actually the same statement. So the proposition is still true. So the x between i, uh, sorry, x with the index i between complexes A and B is isomorphic to the home in the derived category of A between objects A and B shifted by i. So this proposition is still true. Now, there is a little remark about this. And this remark also follows immediately from the previous exercise. That if you take A1 and A2, and this is a quasi-isomorphism between A1 and A2, Right, so if you try to write the corresponding maps between R homes, right, we have R home, so R plus maybe home A1 and some object B. Uh, actually, this goes in the other direction, so this is A2, and I have a map to the R plus home. A1 and B. Right, but how I can compute this R home? I suppose to take object B and replace this B with resolution, with injective resolution. So take B and replace this with injective resolution. And then I can write instead of the R plus home, just home A2 I, which is mapped to the internal home A1 and I. But now we know this is quasi-isomorphism. The second argument is the complex of injectives. Right? So we know that this arrow is quasi-isomorphism. So it means if I replace the first argument by a quasi-isomorphic argument, I'll get the same answers. So the result is that we actually have a functor. So the functor in this case will be mm, 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 okay. So maybe I can write this like, like this: R home plus, uh, sorry, R home bullet of the A arguments A and B. This is as a bifunctor, a functor defined on the D of A. Now in the first argument this is contravariant, so I need to write opposite. Then second argument is in the D plus of A, and it takes values in the D plus 
of a billion groups. So we get the following by functor. <coughs> so let's say this is the first remark. And the second remark, of course, you can dualize everything and consider categories. So if A has enough projectives, then we can define functor as follows. So mm, I don't like this notation because here I fix the arguments. So maybe it will be better if I just don't write arguments and take this as a bifunctor. And if you dualize the construction, you'll get a bifunctor from the d minus of a times d of a opposite to the d minus of a b. Sorry, there's something wrong. Opposite is still on the first argument. Okay, I think this now makes sense. Final remark about the X is the following the Yoneda product. Yoneda's product. So perhaps in your homological algebra classes, you've seen a definition where you take, say, X with the index i between two objects, say, X and y. Then another element in the xj between objects now y and z. And there is a so-called Yonetis product, which gives you an element in the x in the x group with the index i plus j, and objects are x and z. Right? Now with our interpretation using triangulate categories, this definition of Yonetis product is completely elementary. So if you don't even know the definition, you can do the following and see that there is a map like this. Well, you can just reinterpret this X as a in the derived category of X and Y shifted by I. Now this will be the home in the derived category Y and Z shifted by J. And it's supposed to be mapped to the home in the derived category between objects X and Z shifted by I plus J. All right? But now I claim that this is just a composition of maps in the, in the derived category, All right? So I have a map X to the Y shifted by i, right? Now I have a map here. So, but if I have a map here, so suppose I choose phi here, then I have phi shifted by i, so the i I'm taking from the first argument, and that's a map from the y shifted by i to the z shifted by i plus j. Right, so I take the first map, and then I take the composition with the second map, but shifted by i. So I get a map to the z shifted by i plus j. And take the composition. This composition is exactly is in this home. 
So using template categories, the definition of the UNEDAS product is completely elementary. Okay. So let's start derived categories of coherent shifts. <coughs> so first of all, I assume once and for all that all my schemes are not Irian. So all schemes are not Irian. Now with the scheme I can associate several abelian categories. So I have a category of OX modules. So like this, modules over shift OX. Then I have maybe a subcategory of the quasi-coherent shifts on X. And inside quasi-coherent shifts, I have coherent shifts. So these are the three basic abelian categories that I'm going to work with. And of course, I can consider derived versions, der derived, derived categories of these abelian categories. So first, we have the following proposition. that if I take D star, where this star could be plus or B, so this is, this works for two versions of the derived category of the quasi-coherent shifts on X, then this is isomorphic to the D star of the modules on X, but I need to assume that if I, if I take this category, that complex of the modules has quasi-coherent cohomology. So where the second part is the derived category. OX modules is quasi coherent homology. I want to say that this, this statement is not very interesting because this follows immediately from a general machinery. And general machinery could be formulated as an exercise. So, but, uh, it, well, there are no new ideas in the proof of this exercise. You can go back to the definition of the resolution and try to do something like this, and this, that would be a solution for this exercise. So. Exercise quite general is the following. Now let me take a fixed subcategory in the abelian category B. So let A be a thick subcategory of abelian category B. So the terminology is not very convenient because this is again thick. We already defined thick subcategories of four tangled categories, but now this is something completely different. So this is a situation, I don't have any tangled categories. This is abelian and this is abelian subcategory. So remark, 
an abelian cat an abelian subcategory is called thick if it is closed under extensions. Well, namely, you have the following. If you have short exact sequence, and you know that x prime and x double prime are inside A, then the conclusion is that x in the middle is also in A. Right, so x is called an extension of the x double prime by the x prime, and then any extension is supposed to be inside this subcategory. So in this case, the subcategory is called A. Okay, so we have a thick subcategory of an abelian category. So suppose that any object A in this abelian category can be embedded in an object A prime, again, in the same category A, but now because it's a subcategory, I can consider this A prime as an object in B. Right? So such that A prime is injective as object of B. So if you have this, then it's enough to conclude that in general, we have the equivalence of triangulate categories. So you have D plus of A. So this is clearly can be embedded into the category D plus of B. But now, as before, I want to assume that my cohomology of the complexes of objects of B belong to the subcategory A. And they claim that this embedding is actually an equivalence of triangulated categories. So then this, this embedding, so then the embedding is an equivalence of triangulated categories. So where I need to define what the star is. So star could be plus or B. And the definition for the category on the right is the same as before. So D star of B with the subscript A is the derived category of complexes objects of A with cohomology, sorry, of objects of, of B, right, with cohomology in A. Yes, so this, you, you, you take derived category of P, and inside this derived category, a triangulate category, you can consider a special subcategory with this additional condition. So if, if you kind of try to do something more general than this, or maybe something of another type, it's, it, it, it's not clear that objects of this type will be derived categories of something. But it is derived category in this situation. So this derived category of A. So I'm going to leave this. Of course, the proposition follows immediately from this exercise. In just a very special case, you can just notice what you need to take as A and B. So because this is general, and the idea for the proof of, for this statement we already know, I'm going to leave this an exercise. But instead, I'm going to prove something else, 
which doesn't follow from some general machinery, which is a specific statement about coherent shifts. <coughs> so this is the following proposition. You can take the dB of x. What's the dB of x? Well, maybe before I even formulate the proposition, let me just say that I have notation. So what's the dB of x? Well, this is, by definition, just a short notation for the dB of the coherent shifts of, on x. So there will be several interesting statements about this particular triangulated category. So it's very convenient to have some short notation. So proposition is the following, <coughs> that the dB of x, again, this can be embedded, and this embedding give me an equivalence. So this is embedded in the dB of the quasi-coherent shifts. And the cohomology are supposed to be coherent shifts. So I'm not going to define this object. I think it's clear now we've, we've, seen, we've done this twice, that now you're supposed to take complexes of quasi-coherent shifts on x. And homology are supposed to be coherent. That's the definition of this object. And of course, if you try to derive this proposition from the previous exercise, you can see that you fail immediately. It doesn't work, right? Because you, you suppose, in this case, quasi-coherent is the category B. If you try to take coherent as the category A, well, it means that you're supposed to embed any, for example, shift into the injective, into, into the coherent shift, which is injective which is not possible. Right? There, are, there are not so many injective coherent shifts. So injectives, injectives usually are not fin finitely generated. So we need some separate proof for this statement that doesn't follow from this exercise. So let's do the proof. <coughs> oh, actually, before I, before I do the proof, I, I start with the following lemma from commutative algebra and algebraic geometry. So if you have, so let G be a quasi-coherent shift on X. And suppose you have F, which is coherent on X. And you have a map from G to F, which is surjective. Or maybe epimorphism. So this abelian category, I can talk about epimorphisms. So you have, I have such epimorphism from a quasi-coherent shift to a coherent shift. And then there is a shift G prime, which is coherent on X. And G prime sits inside G, such that if you consider the composition, so you have embedding of the G prime into G, and then G is mapped to the F, right? So this composition is still epimorphism. So first of all, is just the spec of some ring, the statement is clear. And so this statement now will be a statement for modules. And for modules, this is clear, right? If G and F are modules, well, we can, we can take finitely many generators for the F, take the pre-images, and, and see what the pre-images can generate inside G. So the first part is clear. And the second part, if you want to generalize this from the rings to the schemes, it's also a kind of standard situation. You take an open subset. So for any u in x open, well, you know by the first part that there is g prime of u, which sits inside g restricted to you.
So there is a coherent shift in G prime. So now we need to prove this, the proposition. <clears throat> so let me introduce some notation. Suppose I have some complex G. So this is a bounded complex. So I suppose that it is 0 until I reach some uh, Gn. So then there are several non-zero objects up to some Gm. And then after m, I also the rest will be, will be again zeros. Right, so the so this G sits inside the DB. So the the right hand side, uh, hand side of this equivalence. So this is DB or the quasi coherent shifts on X, and I assume that this has coherent homology. So what's the goal? Is the goal is to show that this complex is quasi-isomorphic to a bounded complex, right? so the bounded complex of coherent shifts. <coughs> OK, so the proof is by induction. So I can start from the right and move to the left. So suppose that I choose, so suppose we choose coherent homology HI, so position I between N and M. So I is between N and M. <coughs> and we assume that we already know that GI are coherent, uh, sorry, G, J are coherent for J larger than I. Right. Definitely we can do this. For example, I can start with this zero's position. So then I can assume that this is coherent shift. Well, zero, zero shift is coherent. So then the argument that I'm going to do, going to show to me that I can replace this complex with another complex, which is quasi-isomorphic. But here in the position GM, I'll get some, something finally generated. But instead of doing this first step, I'm just going to do in general, the general step. And of course, the base of the induction will be just a special case. <clears throat> so the proof is the following. I have a canonical surjection from the G with the index J to the image of the differential with the index J, just by definition of the image, which sits, of course, inside G with the index J plus 1. Now I can apply the lemma. And by the lemma, I know that there is some G1 say also with the index j that can be embedded into g with the index j and such that if i take the composition i still get a surjective map okay and also i know that i have a map from the kernel of the differential with the index j to the homology
with the index j. Now I do the same thing. In, in I choose some g2 with the index j, which is finitely generated or coherent, sitting inside the kernel, such that the composition is still surjective or epimorphic. So this g1, j, g2, j, they are coherent on x. <clears throat> okay, and I define g with the tilde and index j as a subshift generated by both of this j j1 and j2. So clearly, this sits inside by construction inside g with the index j. And I also define g with the tilde with the index j minus 1. So is the preimage of the g with the tilde and index i under the differential. So under the differential from the g with the index j minus 1 to the g, j. Okay. So now we have the following. We constructed new complex, so where all the terms are the same except the two positions. We have the positions with the index j and j minus one. So I have um, complex as before. So then I reach somewhere g with the index j minus 1. This is mapped to the g with the index j. So now I assume that after this position, I have coherent shifts. So I keep these objects the same. Now, instead of the g with the index j, I'm going to use g tilde with the index j and g tilde with the index j minus 1. So then I can embed this and get a commutative square by the definition of these objects, especially g tilde with the index j minus 1. And the rest of the complex is the same. The rest, I mean, on, on the left and on the right. But if you look at the defining properties, how we define these objects, you'll see that the cohomology are the same. So these two embeddings actually give you quasi-isomorphism. So this is quasi-isomorphism. And we just continue doing this until we reach position, position n and we'll get a quasi-isomorphic complex of coherent shifts. Okay. So next we're going to discuss the following topic. Sir duality and Sir functors.
So in this section, well, we start with the shared duality. I'm not going to prove shared duality, of course. I'm just going to use, the, use it and interpret this in some abstract form that we have some functor with some properties. And this ca can be done. So this abstract functor can be defined actually on any k-linear category with fine-dimensional fine Holmes, uh, Holmes vector spaces. And we're going to see that if this category is triangulated, then the func uh, serif functor is automatically exact. So, but let's first start with the serif duality. So essentially, this is the motivation for the serif functors. I assume that x is smooth and projective. So then, I assume that you know the following form of the serif duality: that if you take x group between two shifts, say E and F. Uh, x with the index i, then this is isomorphic to the x with the index n minus i. Now we need, need to switch the order. So first argument is f, the second argument is e. Then you need to twist this by the canonical bundle, and you need to take the dual as a vector space. So this star, this is just the home the vector space k. So x is smooth and projective, and this is defined over field k. So this is the standard form of the shared duality. Well, first of all, I claim that this is still true if instead of sheaves, I consider complexes of sheaves. Say I take objects E and F in the DB of X. So complexes of coherent shifts. This is still true. But also, yeah, by, by, by the way, maybe I need to say what omega X is. Because this is a smooth variety, I can simply define this canonical bundle as the answer exterior power of the omega one. Omega one. Omega one is just the canonic uh, the cotangent bundle on X. And this is called the canonical, canonical uh, bundle. Well, because you know this is a line bundle, right? So this is of rank n. So you take n exterior power, you can get something of rank 1. So this is the same thing as a line bundle, or the same thing as a divisor. So this is O of k and x. And this kx is called the canonical class. Of x. So, but what I want to do, I want to look at this formula and notice that if I introduce functor s, of course this depends on x, so if I want to define this on a shift e, I do the following, or shift or complex of coherent shifts, so I take this complex of coherent shifts, I take the tensor product with omega x, and then I shift everything by n. Now with this definition, I have the following, that the third duality equivalently, this is exactly the same formula, will be written as the home in the derived category. So mm, I need to write something like db of x, so home in the derived cate category db of x, between e and f is isomorphic. Of course, this isomorphism is natural in the both arguments. So to the home in the db of x. And here I have first argument is f. And the second argument is the functor S applied to the E. And I have dual. So we have this. And now this is a motivation to give a definition of an abstract serif functor. So this, this, this will be an example of a serif factor on a triangulated category. So abstract definition is the following. So let 
A, B, a K linear, home finite category. So home finite means that if you consider the dimension of the home, so K linear means that all the home spaces are vector spaces over K. And home finite means that if you consider, if you compute the dimension of such homes, then this is some finite number. So all the homes are finite dimensional vector spaces. This is the definition of a home finite category. So you can see that the definition that I'm going to give quite, is quite general. I don't assume that something is abelian or triangulated. It's enough to have K linear home finite category. <coughs> so a SER functor on the category A is an equivalence, K linear equivalence. S from A to the A. Such that there is an isomorphism. And the isomorphism is exactly as before, so as in our example. So let's let's call this isomorphism eta with arguments A and B. So this will be a map from the home. A and B to the home, so of course home in the category A, home B S of A, and then I need to take the dual. And because I always need to take, when I do the computation of the self functions, I quite often need to take these duals, double duals, and so on. It is quite convenient to assume that the category is home finite. So potentially, in principle, you can use this definition without this assumption that this is home finite, but it's convenient to have this part of, as a part of the definition. So then there is an isomorphism, and of course this isomorphism has to be factorial in the first and the second argument. So it looks like I have only three minutes left, so it's not enough to prove the next proposition, but it's enough to discuss one remark. So our remark is the following. If X is projective, then db of x is home finite, right? So this is quite famous theorem from algebraic geometry. So probably you know this theorem in the following version. So in particular, what you probably know, uh, the following is true that if you take some, say, cohomology on a projective variety with a coherent shift, so F is coherent, then the cohomology space is finite dimensional, right? So this is something that you prove in algebraic geometry. It's not a trivial statement. But what would be the next step? Uh, of course, the cohomology it's just a special case of the X. Right, so this statement is telling us this, this X spaces are 
finite dimensional. Now, the next step would be is to show that actually x, say i, between two coherent shifts is finite dimensional. I'm not sure about this statement. Was it proven in the algebraic geometry class that the, that the x spaces are finite dimensional? So if E is locally free, then this refuses to separate. Yes. But in general, E is only coherent. So maybe this is something to think about. Maybe if you review your argument how you can prove this, Maybe it would be enough to prove actually this. So question mark. But now, well, actually, what we need to show is we need to show that the x, not between two shifts, but the two complexes of coherent shifts is finite dimensional. I claim that this part can be immediately derived from the previous part. And this is the standard sequence, uh, spe standard spectral se sequence argument. So we just consider a spectral sequence that goes as follows. So E2 page with partition P and Q is the X P. Then you take the cohomology H at the position minus Q of the E. And this is converges to the X P plus Q, E and F. So I'm not going to prove anything, uh, any of these statements because, well, if you don't know spectral sequences, it won't make any sense. If you know spectral sequences, this is probably already obvious that this works. So probably I suggest if you don't know anything of this, you start here. You, you try to learn the proof of this statement. Then you try to generalize this to this statement. And this is not an algebraic geometry statement. This is a very easy statement about spectral sequences. So OK, anyway, this is something to think about why this is a home finite category. So that's all for today. And next time, we prove some abstract properties of serif functors in the beginning of the lecture. So I would say in the first half of the lecture. And starting in the second half of the lecture, we start derived functors in algebraic geometry. <laughs>